The alchemical stone, the lapis, symbolizes something that can never be lost or dissolved, something eternal that some alchemists compared to the mystical experience of God within one's own soul. It usually takes prolonged suffering to burn away all the superfluous psychic elements concealing the stone, but some profound inner experience of the self does occur to most people at least once in a lifetime. From the psychological standpoint, a genuinely religious attitude consists of an effort to discover this unique experience and gradually to keep in tune with it. It is relevant that a stone is itself something permanent, so that the self becomes an inner partner toward whom one's attention is continually turned. Trying to give the living reality of the self a constant amount of daily attention is like trying to live simultaneously on two levels or in two different worlds. One gives one's mind as before to outer duties, but at the same time one remains alert for hints and signs, both in dreams and in external events, that the self uses to symbolize its intentions, the direction in which the life stream is moving. Thus, in the midst of ordinary outer life, one is suddenly caught up in an exciting inner adventure, and because it is unique for each individual, it cannot be copied or stolen. There are two main reasons why man loses contact with the regulating center of his soul. One of them is that some single instinctive drive or emotional image can carry him into a one-sidedness that makes him lose his balance. This also happens to animals. For example, a sexually excited stag will completely forget hunger and security. This one-sidedness and consequent loss of balance are much dreaded by primitives who call it loss of soul. Another threat to the inner balance comes from excessive daydreaming, which, in a secret way, usually circles around particular complexes. In fact, daydreams arise just because they connect a man with his complexes. At the same time, they threaten the concentration and continuity of his consciousness. The second obstacle is exactly the opposite, and is due to an over-consolidation of ego-consciousness. Although a disciplined consciousness is necessary for the performance of civilized activities, we know what happens if a railway signalman lapses into daydreaming. It has the serious disadvantage that it is apt to block the reception of impulses and messages coming from the center. This is why so many dreams of civilized people are concerned with restoring this receptivity by attempting to correct the attitude of consciousness toward the unconscious center or self. In fact, whenever a human being genuinely turns to the inner world and tries to know himself, not by ruminating about his subjective thoughts and feelings, but by following the expressions of his own objective nature, such as dreams and genuine fantasies, then sooner or later the self emerges. The ego will then find an inner power that contains all the possibilities of renewal. But there is a great difficulty that I have mentioned only indirectly up till now. This is that every personification of the unconscious, the shadow, the anima, the animus, and the self, has both a light and a dark aspect. We saw before that the shadow may be base or evil, an instinctive drive that one ought to overcome. It may, however, be an impulse toward growth that one should cultivate and follow. In the same way, the anima and animus have dual aspects. They can bring life-giving development and creativeness to the personality, or they can cause petrification and physical death. And even the self, the all-embracing symbol of the unconscious, has an ambivalent effect, as for instance in the Eskimo tale, when the little woman offered to save the heroine from the moon spirit, but actually turned her into a spider. The dark side of the self is the most dangerous thing of all precisely because the self is the greatest power in the psyche. It can cause people to spin megalomaniac or other delusory fantasies that catch them up and possess them. A person in this state thinks with mounting excitement that he has grasped and solved the great cosmic riddles. He therefore loses all touch with human reality. A reliable symptom of this condition is the loss of one's sense of humor and of human contacts. Thus, the emerging of the self may bring great danger to a man's conscious ego. In order to understand the symbolic indications of the unconscious, one must be careful not to get outside oneself or beside oneself, but to stay emotionally within oneself. Indeed, it is vitally important that the ego should continue to function in normal ways. Only if I remain an ordinary human being, conscious of my incompleteness, 
can I become receptive to the significant contents and processes of the unconscious. But how can a human being stand the tension of feeling himself at one with the whole universe while at the same time he is only a miserable earthly human creature? If, on the one hand, I despise myself as merely a statistical cipher, my life has no meaning and is not worth living. But if, on the other hand, I feel myself to be part of something much greater, how am I to keep my feet on the ground? It is very difficult indeed to keep these inner opposites united within oneself without toppling over into one or the other extreme, 